Welcome. I'm, this is Lakshmi Chella, and welcome to our weekly COVID updates for employers and foreign workers. I'm going to give a few seconds for people to join. Um, but as the United States is, uh, more, more states are opening up. I hope people are still practicing um, safe social distancing. And uh, because uh, it clearly is not over yet. So we should all still be very cautious and careful as we, um, as, a, as the states open up and localities open up and uh, people who have been secluded are dying to get back together. Um, I know it's tough, but this has been a really nice way that I can connect with um, all of you every week while giving you updates on, oh, Am I on mute? No. Can you all not hear me? If you can't hear me, send, okay, good. Somebody said that they can. Okay, good. Audio is working. I thought so. Um, one thing that my husband always tells me is my voice carries really loud. So I, I didn't think anyone would have a problem hearing what I had to say. But um, we're trying to, like I said, give you weekly updates on, um, you know, just everything that's, you know, all the changes that are taking place. So let's get started with um, this week's COVID update. Um, one thing before we move forward that you may find interesting is the USCIS um, is, may have a problem making payroll because of the decrease in applications. The USCIS is different from most uh, agencies because the majority of it is self-funded. And for any of you that have uh, filed applications, you know that the fees can be really steep. So um, they've asked um, Congress for uh, some assistance to help them get through you know, their shortfall. I think it's 1.2 uh, million um, in aid. And what we will probably be seeing is again a hike in in fees so let's get started with uh what's the latest in immigration the things we're going to cover today um and every week what i've always stated this that we pick our topics based on questions that have um that you all send us so you dictate what our agenda is and so if there's <clears throat> Anything you'd like us to cover next week, you know, um, email us at info at cellolaw.com and let us know uh, what topics you'd like us to cover. Uh, last week, we went over I-9 and employers' responsibilities and documentation. This week, we're going to go over some of uh, the legislation and um, some of the proposed changes that people have been hearing about and are a little worried about. So um, let's get started. So last week we talked about the I-9 review. If you did not get a chance to take a look at our I-9 compliance uh, webinar, please um, make sure that you uh, subscribe to us on YouTube channel, uh, the Cella Law Group, and you can you know, listen to a recap or if you need a refresher course, uh, please feel free to do that. And you know, if there's any comments or questions you have, we'll be happy to answer it um, on the YouTube channel or you can email us, whichever you prefer. So today we're gonna cover the HEROES Act, um, which was signed by the House and uh, go over a little bit about the presidential proclamation, which we touched on a few weeks ago, the Healthcare Worker Resiliency Act and the FAB4, uh, Senator Cotton, Cruz, Grassley, and Hawley, um, their letter to the White House uh, trying to ask for a curbing in, in immigration. So let's go ahead and get started. The HEROES Act. So the HEROES Act is um, a bill that was uh, signed in by, proposed by the House Democrats. It has, um, you know, the president has threatened to veto it if some provisions aren't changed and it still has to pass the Senate. So the way legislation works in the United States, a bill is introduced either in the House or the Senate. Those are the two part, two, it's a, 
uh, two chamber system, if you will. So you have the House of Representatives and then you have uh, the Senators. House of Representatives are selected based on population. Senators, it is, there are two senators per uh, each state. And um, the House is now uh, run, well, the majority of the House of Democrats. The Senate is still majority, the, the majority is still uh, a Republican Senate. So that's where you're gonna have some, you know, pushback with some of the things that they're proposing. So the HEROES Act, it's like a 90 page um, act and um, they are asking for a number of things like, for example, extensions of filings that are affected by processing delays and restrictions, um, automatic extensions during and work authorization during the crisis, issued Im immigrant visas extended beyond the expiration dates, unused um, immigration numbers um, rolled in for subsequent years. So remember there's a backlog for permanent resident processing for some countries where they're oversubscribed. So countries where there's a large influx of immigrants into the United States like China and India, um, you know, they have a backlog. So um, the, you know, on average for India, um, 12 years for some categories um, for permanent residents. So what they're asking is to use the unused numbers, um, you know, and you know, increasing the voluntary departure deadlines. Voluntary departure is for those people who are in immigration proceedings and they say, hey, you don't have to deport me. I will voluntarily leave, voluntarily leave. So now with the pandemic, um, they're asking for those deadlines to be uh, increased. And temporary accommodations for naturaliz naturalization oath ceremonies due to public uh, health emergency like the remote administration and I don't know why they're not doing that. The USCIS, well, um, immigration courts have been doing remote processing for a long time, so I don't know why they won't um, engage in remote processing for the oath ceremonies. Temp temporary protections for essential workers in infrastructure, um, like undocumented workers that are uh, working in critical infrastructure projects deferred action, you know, work authorization, and um, employers giving employers some, some protections during um, the COVID epidemic who are in infrastructure, uh, who may be employing undocumented workers. And allowing workers, um, you know, anyone that's doing COVID-19 work, you know, allowing those workers who are stuck in the visa backlogs to be eligible for, uh, to apply for permanent residency. Expedite non-immigrant applications for medical professionals and researchers doing work in COVID. Um, transfer em employees to COVID spots to address the emergency and permanently authorize the Conrad 30 waiver program for doctors, doctors who uh, engage in a residency program in the United States when they do that on a J visa, they are automatically, uh, they have a two year home residency requirement, which means they have to go back to their home country within uh, a two year period. Now, the exception for that is if they work in a rural area, underserved area, and there are only certain number of those that are allowed, but that's called um, the Conrad 30 waiver program. So if they can apply for that waiver program and they work in the underserved area for a certain period of time, they are, the two years uh, of home residency requirement is removed. We would not have healthcare in rural areas if it wasn't for uh, foreign doctors who are trying to get their waiver removed. So this is you know, really critical in those areas, um, in the more rural areas where they don't have sufficient healthcare. ICE detention, um, they wanna assess the need for continued detention, prioritize non-mandatory detention for release on recognizance or an alternative detention program. They have these ankle bracelets um, for where they can detect 
you know, folks that are released. Um, and those ankle bracelets cost the government $11 per day or 11 to $16 per day. Whereas an average detainee, it costs the government anywhere from 200 to $300 per day. Um, when I say it costs the government, it's our tax dollars that pays for that. And now with um, close quarters and detention facilities, the COVID uh, pandemic is just on the rise. So, you know, not only for, you know, it would be beneficial from, a, from an economic perspective, uh, but also from a human rights uh, healthcare perspective. Um, so those are some of the things that have been proposed. Um, I, you can suspect that a lot of this is gonna get, you're gonna get pushback uh, from the Senate. So we don't really need, we're not really sure whether it, it will be passed. There may be some of these provisions um, that will, that the Senate will agree on, uh, especially pertaining to the healthcare workers. I think everybody's on board with that. But there is this uh, talk about, because the unemployment rate's so high, I don't know if the other protections will be enforced. And this kind of um, piggybacks on the fact that when I told you earlier that the USCIS is out of funds um, and they're going to have to do some cutting back, you know, allowing automatic extensions for work authorization. Um, and for extensions of status may be a good way in which to reduce their workload, but we'll see. Naturalization uh, ceremonies. Like I said, there have been, you know, the USCIS has used, or the immigration courts rather, has used um, remote, they've had remote hearings um, with, individuals that are in jail that also because you know you've got your if somebody has committed a crime you have to serve your criminal term and then you get detained so uh, a lot of times you know the immigration court will use uh, remote hearings for those individuals and um, I've been involved in a lot of Department of Labor hearings all over the United States and I've you know, they've always been conducted remotely. Um, so I've never had to fly out to actually represent my client in the Department of Labor um, dispute. So I don't understand why they won't do it for the naturalization ceremony, but there may be some um, political advantages in a presidential campaign year. I mean, they, there's been a lot said that immigrants by and large um, vote Democrat, which I don't think that that's necessarily true, but um, so there may not be the incentive to really want to expedite the naturalization ceremonies and get people naturalized before um, the election this year. So that's just, these are you know, just my thoughts and my, edit, my editorializing what's going on. But I would imagine that there is part of that in the um, working in the back, background. There are a lot of um, really critical infrastructure projects right now, uh, whether you know, in so many areas because of the COVID. So what they are trying to do is um, have some protections, not only for the employees, but for the employers that are doing critical infrastructure positions, uh, especially those construction is um, one of the fields that's very high. It's got a high level of undocumented immigrants. In fact, I've had many companies tell me that they've tried, you know, and hiring locally and they're just not getting enough people to actually do um, construction work. And so, they wouldn't be able to do any type of infrastructure project without undocumented workers. So that's why they're requesting the uh, protections, but, uh, you know, we probably will have some uh, pushback from, from the Senate. So 
supplementing the COVID workforce is something that everyone has uh, been behind. As you know, all you have to do is turn on the TV um, and, and every single, you know, um, expert healthcare worker that's coming on a news program is um, either an immigrant or a son, and, son or daughter of an immigrant, uh, which is evident by usually the name or, you know, the background. And uh, the vast majority of people who are working on the front lines are, you know, um, immigrants for, you know, in this COVID crisis. So because they're so integral and we have such a vast shortage of healthcare workers, we are going to have by 2030 uh, a phenomenal shortfall in nurses and doctors in this country. So, um, and we're on that trajectory right now. So they, these protections that are allowing people who are actually working in COVID to um, get certain immigration benefits, um, I think would have vast support uh, for both you know, for the Senate as well. As I said, the issues that are happening at detention facilities are, um, they're a human rights issue, really. Um, a lot of the people that are, a vast majority of the people that are in detention, and if you've never uh, looked at this, Syracuse University has a um, nonpartisan basically immigration um, research think tank. And they track, you know, the number of people who are placed in detention with, you know, um, you know the, the records of who have been uh, really, you know, committed crimes. So, you know, how long they've had to, you know, that's how they can assess whether the individuals, the vast majority of people who are detained have, have actually committed serious crimes. And the majority of them, of the people who are detained, they're, what they did, they're illegal because they, they committed a crime, they did some illegal things. And so the crime has been their immigration breach. Um, so they haven't, you know, there's not a lot of people there that have committed really any other crime but their immigration, um, you know, uh, which, if you entered without authorization for the first five years, it is a criminal offense and it's akin to a reckless driving charge um, in any given state. If you have, uh, if your entry was uh, past five years, it's no longer a crime, it becomes a civil matter. So it does make sense to the, for, for those people who have really not committed grave offenses to um, uh, be able to be allowed to, you know, um, use an alternative means for actual detention. But the uh, private prison lobby is very, it's got a strong voice. And they are the ones that are making the money off all this detention. Our tax dollars are lining the pockets of, you know, private prisons and um, they are the ones that are benefiting from this. So I don't know if they would um, you know, allow that so easily. We have a question. After 17 years, I finally got scheduled for an interview on April 10th. Now, since the offices are closed, it has been canceled. So what is the time span for the next interview once the offices are open or can they issue direct green card without having an interview? Um, that's a wonderful question. So uh, two things, um, in terms of when can you expect, remember the offices have been closed for quite some time now. Their backlogs are ridiculous. On top of that, they don't have any funding. Uh, they desperately need money from Congress. Uh, so with those two in play, we don't know, you know when they will uh, decide to do that. It does make sense for them to issue uh, permanent residence without an interview. In fact, work-related, um, those in the work-related permanent residence process never had interviews before, but it was this administration that instituted interviews 
even for work-related uh, permanent residents, permanent residency. So the likelihood that they will allow it, at least in this administration, without an interview is uh, very slim. But, you know, like I said, they don't have the money and they don't have the resources. So that may impact um, some of the things that they want to do but can't do. So the HEROES Act, um, I think, yes, so we talked about the HEROES Act, that's it, oops. There we go. Um, we discussed a few weeks ago the presidential proclamation. And the one thing I kept telling everyone was um, that there was a provision in there that said that um, they might expand on any restrictions, but the deadline for that is uh, coming soon, May 22nd, 2020. So um, we'll have to, we'll keep an eye on that. If you don't follow us um, on Facebook or Twitter, I would suggest you do because that's where you'll get the immediate um, updates on what's happening. Um, some of the things that they are looking to target is H-1B visa holders, um, perhaps um, even, you know, F-1s, H-2Bs. And one of the things that they are, you know, and a lot of this is conjecture because no one really knows, but um, some of the things that they have discussed is like those H-1B visa holders who have been laid off. You know, they usually have that 60 day protection. Um, one of the thoughts is let's remove the protection so they have to depart. And um, the whole idea is to protect, um, you know, US workforce. Now, like I said, with any type of executive order, even though the presidential powers are broad, they're not absolute. So the, uh, any restriction that's put in place, there has to be, you know, for, for the president to use something as, you know, major as in, an executive order, um, there has to be a relationship between what it is they're trying to achieve and, um, you know, evidence of the harm. So um, if you remember when the, travel bans were first put in place, they were uh, shut down because there was no evidence that they could show that restricting travel from these countries would actually uh, protect the United States. So then they had to kind of uh, make it more narrow in order for the travel bans, um, for the courts to allow the travel ban. We have another question. As part of the PERM recruitment activities, will postings be done at the place in Portland still be valid since most of the workforce is currently working from home. We actually um, um, have a memo on, you know, all the uh, PERM related uh, posting compliance. And if you email us at info at chellalaw.com, or if you look back at one of our previous YouTube videos, we address that, but we would be happy to send you a memo. So then you have uh, point by point um, reference, you know, as you're going through this process, not only with the posting, but with other uh, regulatory changes as well. Again, that's info at chalalaw.com. So um, we will likely see, stay tuned this week to see if there's any additional restrictions that are put in place. Then um, you've got what was introduced was the Healthcare Resiliency Act, uh, Healthcare Worker Resiliency Act. And this is a bipartisan bill of senators, uh, a temporary stop, stop gap to meet the demand for healthcare workers. As I said, healthcare workers is something that uh, both Democrats and Republicans um, can agree would, you know, uh, would really, you know, not having enough healthcare workers would really impact um, how we're able to address the COVID pandemic. And, you know, with 
experts saying that this, you know, we can see another um, resurgence of this in the fall, you know, there are all these steps to try to make sure that we have sufficient healthcare workers to address it. So um, it's really interesting. Um, it would address the, the doctors that are working in the US and stuck in that, like I said, that really long backlog waiting for their permanent residency. Um, it would add a separate pool of um, visas just for nurses and physicians and it would exempt doctors and nurses from the annual cap. Now, um, before nurses were able to, they were on, um, they were able to migrate to the United States. I mean, they still can on a, a, a visa pathway that um, is specifically for those occupations that are in shortage. But because there wasn't any backlog, they'd have to go through the permanent residence process, but they could come in on that fairly quickly. Um, when that backlog um, just became, you know, five years, six years, seven years, it no longer was a feasible stopgap measure to bring in nurses. So um, nurses are not eligible for an H-1B for the most part. I mean, you can have, unless it's a specialty nurse, um, because remember for H-1B, you have to have a four-year degree. So a lot of these nursing programs are a two-year program. So unless you're, um, what is it, a nurse physician or you are a supervisor for, you know, the ER, a supervisor ER nurse, or, you know, one of those types of nurse, nurse within nursing, one of those occupations that require a four-year degree, nurses by and large are not eligible for um, an H-1B. So um, it would be great to see if they would be able to open up um, the ability to be able to recruit more healthcare workers in the United States on this program. As a U.S. permanent resident, will I be eligible for unemployment benefits if I am furloughed by my employer? Are there any implications to immigration when unemployment benefits are claimed with respect to the CARES Act. We um, also talked about this before. Remember unemployment, um, you pay into it, you know, with every paycheck, a per certain percentage of, um, you know, the employer pays. So it's a paid benefit. So by obtaining unemployment, it wouldn't uh, trigger the types of issues that are prohibited by the public charge concerns that you may have. So um, it should not be a problem. Like I said, if you want, we have a memo on everything. We try to make sure that if anybody needs any information, we not only tell them about it, but we have something they can reference. So we can send you some information on that if you would like at info at chelalaw.com and we'd be happy to share that with you. So um, the biggest concern everyone's been having is um, these four senators have sent uh, a letter to the president urging a suspension of any type of guest worker program for 60 days except for agriculture on a case-by-case -case basis, um, suspending any new H-1Bs, um, I mean, suspending certain types of non-immigrant visas for a one-year period because of, um, you know, unemployment issues, limiting the H-1B workers to protect current H-1B workers in the U.S., and having exemptions for um, healthcare workers, and a claim that OPT takes jobs for unemployed Americans. So there's some that are saying they'll restrict the STEM OPT. Um, some these particular four senators wanted to curb OPT. Um, you know, there, I think we will see something. I don't think it's going to be as drastic as, you know, suspending um, all new visas uh, because it would be 
catastrophic to our economy. Non-immigrants are not just earners. As I said, they are consumers. So the need for the job is not going to go away if you can't bring them in. They're just going to be working in some other country and uh, paying the taxes in that country and um, buying the homes in that country. And in addition, uh, it is, it's not a zero sum game. I know a lot of you have heard me say that, that a job opening in, you know, the hospital could have an opening for a doctor. And if I was unemployed, I couldn't apply for that. Why? Because I don't have a medical degree and you can't train me quick enough to be a doctor, right? So just because there's a job opening doesn't necessarily mean that it can be filled by someone who doesn't have a job. And that's, um, that's why it is, you know, they say it's not a zero sum game. Um, we have another question. I'm on an L1A, currently I'm a temporary layoff. I was approved, approved an H1B lab for the same employer who holds my L1A. I'm looking at transferring from the approved H1B to another company and applying for the change of status ASAP. Since the H-1B is not active, should I wait for the change of status work or can I work uh, with the receipt um, by the petition? And okay, no. Okay, so the, you're mixing up two things. You're changing status from L1 to H1. You have to, when you change status from one non-immigrant category to another, you have to wait till the change of status is approved before you, um, or you can avail yourself of that status. Now, what you can do is if you apply for it now because you've been furloughed, um, they may, especially because there's a revenue shortfall, they may uh, allow for premium processing to open up fairly soon. So. If they do that, then um, you'd be able to premium process your change of status, but you cannot work on just the receipt notice of your change of status. That is only for, that's the portability of H-1B uh, that you're probably thinking of. If you're on an H-1B already, you're not on an H-1B, you're on an L. If you're on an H-1B, that means you're holding that status in the US. Uh, just because you have an approved petition, that does nothing for you until you either go outside the United States visa process, re-enter and get an I-94 card with that new status, or you file for a change of status in the United States. So you don't hold that status right now. So therefore you don't get the benefit of the portability of H-1B, where if you're on an H-1B and you change employers, you can start working as long as the petition is received by the USCIS. We have another question. Um, any concerns on any on H-1B extensions and how early to apply because the USCIS is working on low staff? You can only apply six months in advance of your expiration. And I would suggest that you apply um, as soon as you're able to do that within that six month period. Premium processing is not there now. And by filing, uh, remember you get another 240 days in which you can work in the United States from the expiration of your H-1B. So the sooner you file, the better. Um, this is a time where there is a high rate, even before COVID, of um, you know H-1B RFEs and denials. So uh, you want to make sure you have sufficient time to put together a strong petition that can be approved. We have another question. Oh, you're welcome, you're welcome. And um, for those of you, um, ah, you know, again, this is pretty much, um, they also wanna curb the EB-5 visa program, which they think is wrought with fraud. Uh, we are lucky that the president's son-in-law, his sister is doing a lot of EB-5 work. Um, so I don't think that they will do away with that um, in their own interests. Um, that's just my opinion. But so that is another uh, issue that was raised by the senators. So 
you know, please make sure that um, you check out our COVID resources and tune into our webinar every Monday. This, this Wednesday, speaking of EB5, um, we have uh, Chella Chai time with, and we'll be speaking to, we'll, we'll talk about EB5 regional centers as an option for permanent residents in the US. And we'll even have um, someone that has operated an EB5 regional center and has, I think at least gone through three to four uh, projects on the EB-5 program and um, been very successful utilizing that. So you can find out, again, the whole idea of Chella Chai Time is so we talk about the immigration matter, but we get people within the field, experts, masters, who can tell you, how does it work? You know, what is, you know, what do they do? And, you know, how do they guarantee with, you know, what's going on now that, um, the project won't go defunct and what are the things you should look for so uh please you know stay tuned for that and i think we've got two more questions is it likely during the election year that he will take immediate action for opt and h1b i i think he may take limited action um but um it's it's really hard to tell what exactly uh, they're going to do. I think there's a lot of push from both sides. Uh, and so is it likely they'll extend the 180 day OPT rule? Um, nothing yet. And, um, but I, I, I think, you know, they may do it in a limited scope for those people who do not have employment. I don't think they'll really touch the OPT. I, I would be surprised, but um, this administration has surprised me a lot. So I, you know, I would never um, presume to guess what they would be willing to do. Can you touch upon the May 22nd outcomes that may affect USCIS? We won't really know. We just know that on the presidential proclamation, they stated that they would um, supplement it uh, with feedback from the USCIS in within 30 days. So that 30 day period is May 22nd. Um, I think again, you know, it may have something to do with H's who are unemployed or um, something to that extent, but you know, it, um, yeah, I'd be, like I said, surprised if they did anything with OBTs, but you don't know, because uh, that would really hurt the academic institutions, which are already um, getting really hit with everything that's going on. I mean, there's a lot of academic institutions because their programs are, you know, like engineering programs or accounting, um, for nationals and they get you know out of state funds for that and that's why our you know they they effectively foreign students effectively subsidize tuition rates for americans so um if they would do something to the opt that would really impact you know foreign students come here there's already been a drop and um like i said it's hurt uh, colleges um, tremendously. And at the same time, you have other countries like um, Australia and even China that are putting in, you know, work authorization as part of the whole process for getting an F1 student. So with less restrictions for three years. So um, you know, we would clearly not be very competitive um, if, if they were to do that. So you know, but it does not always seem like these individuals are looking at um, um, the tax ramifications. UK as well. Uh, yes, maybe UK as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, somebody said UK as well. Yeah. So Canada, um, what struck me funny was that China was looking into this. Um, 
because they really see that it is a tremendous benefit to having the best and brightest from all over the world in your country. And for them, it's not so, it's not so much for the revenue, it's for the innovation. And um, it would be very short-sighted for um, the US government to restrict any, you know, anything to do with OPTs. But like I said, I don't think that they're really functioning on anything that's based on economics or data. So we don't know. But please check out, if you haven't, our YouTube channel at chalala.com. Um, comment, share, subscribe. If you have any questions, uh, email us at info at chalala.com. The Wednesday Chala Chai time should be really uh, interesting because, um, like I said, you get to talk to an EB-5 regional center and find out exactly how uh, that process works. So if you've got friends that may be interested in EB-5, uh, please forward our uh, invite for that to them. And um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Oh, one more question and then we, we are out. Do you have any time numbers for paper visa? Are they responding within? Oh, uh, the processing times. Processing times for any type of filing are delayed. They've been delayed for about a year. So one thing I'd like Congress to ask the USCIS is if they do give them money, they should have a clear breakdown of how they're utilizing um, the funding that they have. I mean, everyone's filing premium processing. That's for, you know 1,400 and something uh, per application. They've got fraud fees. They've got, you know, they've bumped up all their fees um, just last year and they're gonna bump it up again. So what are they using the money for? And why are the processing times so long? Um, so I think there needs to be some accountability, I hope, but we will see. Um, again, I look forward to seeing you all next week. Email us with what topics you'd like us to cover uh, in the inter in interim, stay safe and um, have a fantastic week. Goodbye.